Special Inspector General John Sopko described it as a hopeless nightmare. And depending on who you are, I mean, you can basically just say the same thing about the American police, right? The American military that trained these civilian Afghan police for six to nine months for a very complex position involved watching episodes of NCIS and cops. And again, okay, before you guys get all angry, but this is very similar to the way that the American police is actually trained. It's, except instead of NCIS, it's just old Steven Seagal movies. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm Krish Mohan. Before we dive into this week's episode, just as a little friendly reminder at the top of the show that if you would like to contribute to the show financially, uh, you can do so by becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash krishmohanhaha uh, for only $2 a month, you get exclusive, unreleased stand-up comedy and storytelling material, as well as early access to full, multi-part fork full of noodles, like this following episode that you're going to see. You get to see both parts all in one uh, earlier than anybody else would. Uh, and it all starts at only $2 a month. That's the cost of one cup of coffee. That's one cup of coffee. That's all it costs. Uh, go check it out. Patreon.com slash Krish Mohan, ha ha. And uh, all the work that you see in, in these shows is done just by me. So you'll be helping out this show, uh, Taboo Table Talk, my DIY stand-up comedy touring, and much, much more. Once again, that's Patreon.com slash Krish Mohan, ha ha. Now, on to this week's episode. In his farewell speech, former president and World War II's general of the Supreme Allied Forces, Dwight D. Eisenhower, called out some problems that he foresaw for the United States. We now stand 10 years past the midpoint of a century that has witnessed four major wars among great nations. Three of these involved our own country. Despite these holocausts, America is today the strongest, the most influential, and most productive nation in the world. Understandably proud of this preeminence, we yet realize that America's leadership and prestige depend not merely upon our unmatched material progress, riches, and military strength, but on how we use our power in the interest of world peace and human betterment. This was in 1961, and among these problems, he warned us about giving in to the military-industrial complex. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. Eisenhower wanted us to be a thinking community and didn't want us to forget about our peaceful Methods And if we look at the way that we talk about and revere the American military, we've definitely let patriotism blind us with, a, with an Uncle Sam blindfold and, and put a star-spangled banner ball gag rendering us speechless. We've been lied to repeatedly by our government so that they can push us into wars that have only led to the destruction and creating ethical gray areas in the Middle East. He also addressed the importance of peacekeepers and treating them as equals. During the long lane of the history yet to be written, America knows that this world of ours, ever growing smaller, must avoid becoming a community of dreadful fear and hate and be instead a proud confederation of mutual trust and respect. Such a confederation must be one of equals. The weakest must come to the conference table with the same confidence as do we, protected as we are by our moral, economic, and military strength. 
Now, he did refer to these folks as the weakest because that was still the era where we had reverence for the muscly strongmen who can pull a tank with the sheer might of their butt cheeks, which I will say is uh, is a very practical application for a tank, in my opinion. But it's not true weakness. It's just a physical weakness. I mean, we're not strong enough to pull a Humvee with our teeth, but we are strong enough to say that we shouldn't go to war and set our egos aside to listen to each other so we can come up with an amicable resolution. But plus, no one can afford dental insurance, and dentists are fucking expensive, so, so your feats of physical strength are, are just not really a smart decision to make at this point. The, the economy can't handle the strain of 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 teeth being just completely mangled by because of Humvee pulling. Eisenhower's farewell address can be considered as an anti-war speech to remind us the importance of the decades of anti-war protests that we've seen. But anti-war sentiments are are, are seen as unpatriotic, anti-government, and of course, pussyfooting. And that's always been kind of an odd term to me, right? Either that means that, that you have feet like a cat and you're very nimble and like to stalk your prey at night, or you have vaginas on your feet. And, and that second one really proves how we as a society uh, are collectively failing biology on a very epic level. Look, anti-war activists are seen as, as protests against veterans for their service, but in reality, they're protesting to stop creating more veterans and stand by the ones that have already been created. And anti-war movements are where Democrats and Republicans reach across the aisle to agree to do something about them, okay? And, and what they agree on is that these movement needs to be stopped so that they can just keep putting their dicks on every table around the world with military might. Now, the Republicans use the narratives that we talked about just a few seconds ago, but Democrats are a little sneakier about it. They criticize the methods of execution in militarism. And in Trump's case, uh, this is kind of literal. The Democrats l criticized the way that he executed Iranian General Qassem Soleimani and not the fact that this was an illegal assassination. You have Joe Biden with a very convoluted statement uh, criticizing Trump sort of on, on process grounds, saying, you know, wondering whether Trump has a plan now that he's done this and uh, warning of potential consequences, but not really an outright condemnation. Uh, and that fits in with a long, I think, you know, centrist democratic foreign policy tradition of sharing uh, with neocons and hawks in Washington similar foreign policy goals and only coming out with criticisms when it comes to narrow technical issues like tactics and uh, strategy. It reminds me of when John Kerry, uh, when he ran against uh, George uh, uh, W. Bush in 2004, on the campaign trail, his main critique of Bush when it comes to Iraq was that Bush didn't have a plan to win the peace after launching the war. And of course, it was hard for Kerry to criticize Bush on the Iraq war because Kerry, like Joe Biden, voted for that war. Oh, well, if it were me, I would have poisoned his tea. <laughs> that way, no one could have known it was me. It could have been anyone. Was it me? Oh, I'll never tell. But the Democrats themselves have become the party of war. They themselves fought against the anti-war movement. Right? During the Obama administration, they wouldn't let anybody criticize him uh, because he had just gotten the Affordable Care Act passed. And we need to celebrate that victory instead of criticizing the president. The, the Obama administration uh, went along with the wars in Yemen as well as pretty much started the war in Syria to make the Saudis happy or to keep the Saudis happy. So this this administration is doing what previous administrations have done. But um, yeah, you know, you want to bang your head against something and say this can't actually be happening to a degree. And I saw this uh, in 09. I was I was privileged to take uh, to sit in a, a Democratic House caucus meeting and I spoke to them about Afghanistan. This was like the uh, this was a less than a week after the House had passed the Affordable Care Act, uh, mm -hmm. Obamacare, and um, 
the members of the House, the House Democratic Caucus got all excited about Afghanistan. They were standing up and saying, we can't let this go forward. We got to stop it. This is just as bad as Iraq. This is another Vietnam, et cetera. And then Speaker Pelosi stood up and she said, the president just, uh, just won a huge victory. This is where his political capital lays. We cannot box him in on this. We cannot take away from his political capital. And they all sat down. Um, and that, I, that's what I'm afraid would even if you had a, a Sanders or say Warren came out and she said, I'm going to end all these wars. I'm going to cut the defense budget. When they get in the office, mm -hmm. what's their priority going to be? Their right. priority is going to be getting forward their domestic legislation, whatever. And I'm afraid they're not going to feel they have the ability mm -hmm. to do something about the military because they don't have that political cover. Uh, they don't have that capital, however you want to describe it. So nobody could bring up his increased misguided and murderous drone warfare. I mean, there were even reports of him drone bombing a wedding in the Middle East. L look, Barack, buddy, okay, there's got to be a better way to RSVP no to a wedding, right? When, when you get the invite, try this. The next time this ha I'm sure you're going to get invited to, to a war criminal's wedding. It's going to be fun. Uh, I'm sure a bunch of you will sit and hang out and talk about the countries you destabilize, whatever. But you, but when you get the invite, right, like you just, all you do, you just take the no on there and then underneath you can write uh, and go fuck yourself. Uh, and that way, uh, no civilians died. This is a much better idea, I think. The anti-war movement gets drowned out in America because of black and white rhetoric. Uh, I think people thought that Obama was somehow going to be the anti-war candidate. In fact, he had campaigned and said he was going to bring troops from Iraq to Afghanistan, That's what he called the good war. Um, and some of the big anti-war sort of uh, elements in society, um, uh, they, they, they kind of, I, I think they, they basically packed it up. Right. Uh, and so- And they in, supported in his actions in Libya and Syria specifically. It was almost impossible to organize the kind of liberal progressive wing of the anti-war movement around those conflicts because they fell for these narratives that, you know, these are such evil bad guys and evil dictators that the U.S. has a responsibility to protect civilians abroad. Right. So so you saw a different elaboration of sort of the military doctrine or strategy um, from from the Obama administration. It was a lot more sophisticated than you would say the crass um, hegemonic kind of rhetoric with that was us or against us history. yeah exactly so it was more sophisticated and i had an impact on the anti-war movement we in america we're the good guys and those people all the way over there they're the bad guys okay any questions and they'll paint you in the same lens as those bad guys if you speak out against the military industrial complex, just like former president and general of the Supreme Allied Forces in World War II, Dwight D. Eisenhower, you are portrayed as a terror sympathizer and just as bad as them, which is outrageous because no one in the anti-war movement is holding candlelight vigils for these terror groups in the Middle East. I mean, this kind of thinking is what leads to the criminalization of dissent, and the continued lawlessness of the legislative branch in America. And there is only one party in America, and that's the party of war. So let's take a look at some reasons that we in America should be embracing the anti-war movements despite all of these false stigmas that surround it. Our first reason to be anti-war is to question the America's the world police imperialistic narrative. Now, this was something President Eisenhower echoed a warning about in his farewell address, that America would become the world's police. And perhaps all of this is really predicated and dependent on how the word police is defined. Now, to some of us, uh, that's a safe word, right? Not like a, not like a sexy safe word. Look, I, I, it's cool if you're into role play and, and you have a, a thing for folks in uniform or something, but, but I do feel like yelling the word police is going to kind of kill the mood, kind of like how the police are, are, have been killing innocent people all across America. Now, the word police is usually associated with the notion of protecting and serving, so that's what the idea of being the world's police was initially built on, that we would be the protectors of the world. But 
I mean, if that's the only imperative that your country has, what do you do in times of peace? Well, in order to ensure that there is something to protect, America has created it, its own enemies and manufactured consent to continue the wars across the globe. From the now-revealed hoax surrounding the Gulf of Tonkin that got us into the Vietnam War to the more recent revelations in the Afghan papers, it's basically been revealed time and time again that America did, in fact, manufacture consent for these wars. I mean, several top generals confessed their confusion about the occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, in 2002, the, the American military's battle cry was, I don't know what I've been told. Seriously, I don't, I don't get it, but I do understand what the word quagmire is now because there is a visual representation of it right in front of my eyes. Donald Rumsfeld is quoted to say, I have no visibility of who the real enemies are and that the United States is deficient in human intelligence in the regions. I mean, this is very clearly the origins of his most famous quote, the known knowns and the unknown unknowns. And now, is it very necessary to specify human intelligence? I mean, was there a lot of information gathering from the falcons that were raised by the Shah's falconer from Saudi Arabia to gather intelligence? And the problem really was that Rumsfeld forgot that he didn't speak falcon. You know, oh, what a, what a goof that war criminal is, huh? And... Three-star General Douglas Lute has been quoted to say, he, This is a quote. We were devoid of a fundamental understanding of Afghanistan. We didn't know what we were doing. Uh, he goes on, uh, what are we trying to do here? We don't have the foggiest notion of what we're... If the American people knew the magnitude of this dysfunction, 2,400 lives lost. This is again Lute, blaming the deaths of U.S. military personnel and bureaucratic breakdowns among Congress, the Pentagon, and the state. Who will say... This was in vain. I mean, these are the people running the war. That's what the papers exposed. They were fully aware of the quagmire, the dysfunction, and the failure. Right. And this was very evident in the way that the Afghan police were trained in order to curtail terroristic threats in their own country. Special Inspector General John Sopko described it as a hopeless nightmare. And depending on who you are, I mean, you can basically just say the same thing about the American police, right? The American military that trained these civilian Afghan police for six to nine months for a very complex position involved watching episodes of NCIS and cops. And again, okay, before you guys get all angry about it, this is very similar to the way that the American police is actually trained, it's, except instead of NCIS, it's just old Steven Seagal movies. And by the way, the Afghans were watching the standard NCIS, not this... L.A. and New Orleans bullshit, okay? The Afghans need to learn to love and revere a very old white man. America has deemed itself to be the good guy in these situations, but in reality, there's a very nebulous idea of the bad guy in this area. I mean, as an invading force, it's very hard to claim that you're making a positive impact. Like, I'm fairly certain that Hitler thought that he was making Poland great by blitzkrieging the shit out of their faces. Maybe, maybe America can take, like, a different military po philosophy. Perhaps one from the general of the Supreme Allied Forces in World War II and former President Dwight D. Eisenhower. At this point... Because of America's long history of interventionism in the Middle East, there's just a domino effect of failed states. Even when it tries to make an effort for societal betterment in the Middle East, America pushes racist and xenophobic views in the name of goodwill. I mean, one of their missions in Afghanistan was to get them to be culturally literate and teaching them how to wash their hands. Well, they're culturally, historically, and linguistically illiterate. Precisely. They are arriving in a country with bags of money and machine guns. Right. They're gangsters. Well, that, again, that, and that's what their real ideology is. It's, okay, we have all this money, and this will bend you know, people to our whim. But they don't understand. It's a lot more complicated like that, uh, than that. Um, and, and what actually motivates people 
isn't as uh, as discreet or as simple as many of these. Well, just an say. example of that is one of my favorite little anecdotes. U.S. aid workers once insisted on carrying out a public health project to teach Afghans how to wash their hands, right. not knowing that Muslims with five saying five prayers a day wash their right. hands five times a day. No, so I'm Look, when Americans learn that that wiping your ass with paper is not the best way to get clean, but rather using like a spray of water is is far better. So that the, and other countries are doing it all across the world. Countries like in Europe, in the Middle East, India, and so much more. If they once they get to that point, then then they can make a judgment call on how clean other countries are. Okay, when America starts taking care of its shithole, then it can complain about how shitholy other countries are. But we are told that these are morally good actions because we are supporting the good wars. When we think of World War II, that's, that's what we think of. We think of that as being the good war. But it's odd, right, that we went to war against the Nazis, the, the most evil organization that we could possibly think of. And when we went to war with them, we literally shot them in the fucking face. And yet... We still see them in the streets today. I mean, it turns out that violence doesn't really get rid of these shitty ideologies, but it just pisses them off. Maybe we should try intellect and less emotional outbursts that lead to creating newer versions of the same problem and fueling an industry that just fans the flames. Now, Tom Broca is known for calling World War II veterans the greatest generation, which only seemed to piss off a bunch of World War II veterans. When Tom Brokaw came out with his greatest generation, mm -hmm. there were many combat veterans of World War II who were upset about that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there were people who wrote memoirs in response mm -hmm. to get across their experiences yeah. because they didn't want people to view that as the good war yeah. look the notion of a good war is sold to us to as a false justification by the american empire so that they can dictate what is good or bad primarily the american empire being good and whoever the fuck they decide to wage war against being the bad guys there are no good or bad wars. There are only wars that take the lives of the middle class and divide us even further than we already are. Donald Rumsfeld came out and said that the only way they'd leave Afghanistan was if there was stability in the region to leave. But instabilities are caused by American interventionism, so that's a catch-22 and a confession that they're never going to fucking leave. From mistraining local forces to three-star generals that are uncertain of the mission, this haze of confusion to ensure America's place as the world's police is the primary reason we need anti-war movements to shed a light in this haze of imperialism. So this concludes the first part of this uh, two-part episode of Forkful of Noodles about anti-war movements. Uh, the second part will be out next week. So if you want to uh, get updates on when I'm putting out videos, get updates on uh, when I'll be putting out full versions and uh, part, part one, part two, part three of, of various different things, uh, please make sure that you are subscribed to this page. Please make sure that you're getting alerts to this page um, and, uh, and share all this content out with uh, with your friends with your enemies with whoever you think uh would enjoy this uh i will be doing a couple different uh multi-part episodes uh throughout this year that i am working on that i'm very excited about and if you want to see the multi-part episodes uh top to bottom before anybody else does uh as i mentioned in the, er, er, earlier in this episode you can become a patron over at patreon.com slash krishmohan ha uh and as i also mentioned i am the only person that uh that works on the show so everything that you see uh is all done by me i, I do the the writing the graphics the the editing the the filming the audio i'm i'm doing like five or six 
people's jobs at this point. Um, and uh, and I really enjoy bringing this content to you guys. So if you would like to, uh, if you like to, and you have the ability to financially contribute to the show, uh, please consider becoming a patron over at patreoncom slash Mohan Ha ha. Uh, and of course, uh, if you enjoy this content, if you enjoy talking about issues and ideas and philosophy and uh, and being skeptical and having uh, free thinking discussions, uh, things of that sort, you probably will enjoy my live stand-up comedy show. Uh, right now, I am touring around the country with my current show, Politely Angry, which talks about human competition, organized religion, late-stage capitalism. So if you're interested in uh, hearing uh, my, my point of view in, in that sort of stuff and you like this video, then you're probably going to like uh, like that uh, that show. Uh, so I'm going to be in uh, Vermont. I will be in uh, South Royalton at the Vermont Law School this week. I will be in Middlebury, Vermont, Burlington, Vermont. I'm coming to Rochester, New York. I'm coming to Carnegie, Pennsylvania, uh, which is in the suburbs of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm coming back to Huntsville, Alabama, Springfield, Missouri. Missouri, Fayetteville, Arkansas, Springdale, Arkansas, Denton, Texas, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Uh, I'm also opening for my good friend Lee Camp in Dallas, Texas, and Austin, Texas. We have a bunch of dates coming up uh, all throughout the summer. So if you want to come see me live uh, and you want to know if I'm coming to a city near you, go to my website. Go to ramennoodlescomedy.com. That's R-A-M-A-N, noodlescomedy.com. Uh, check out the tour schedule. Grab your tickets. RSVP to these shows because it's always a good time uh, when uh, when people that watch the show, listen to the podcast, uh, come out and hang out. And we get weird and deep and esoteric and we talk about issues and we have a good time. Uh, so stay tuned uh, for, for part two coming out next week. Uh, once again, make sure that you are subscribed. Make sure that you are getting alerts when I am dropping videos because, uh, as you might know, videos about anti-war movements might not be the most popular thing uh, that uh, that some of these social media and, uh, and tech sites want you to see. Um, so make sure uh, that you're subscribed. Make sure that you share. Uh, those are the two huge ways that you can help uh, in a non-financial way. Uh, but till next week, uh, thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you on the road.